today we're going to talk about prime numbers again differently. So far, we've always thought about prime numbers in terms of whether you can divide them into two things or not. And we said that a number is prime if you can't express it as something times something else except by saying one times itself, which is a very boring way of doing it. But here's another way of thinking about prime numbers. Here's another way of thinking about prime numbers, and this is a little, well, it's a theorem, I suppose. Here's a property of prime numbers. If P is prime, suppose P is prime. Suppose P is prime. Then, if P divides some number A times B, then either P divides A or P divides B. And that's the kind of or that means either this is true or this is true or both is true. So what isn't possible is it's not possible for P to divide neither A nor B. So let's think about this again. We've got this number P that's prime and we're saying that if it divides this product AB, it has to have kind of all gone into A or all gone into B. And intuitively what that's saying, the reason it's true is because how could it how could this be true without P having either all been able to fit into A or all been able to fit into B? Well in that case we'd have had to have sort of split it up and fitted part of it into A and part of it into B, right? But P is prime, so we can't split it up. So it had to all go into A or all go into B. So maybe we should have a look at a few examples as well. For example, let's see. Um, let's, for example, put P equals 3. So what are some numbers that 3 goes into? Well, 3 divides um, 12. So that's, well, what can we express that as? 2 times 6. And 3 doesn't divide 2, but it does divide 6. And what about 3 divides 24? We could express that as 2 times 12. So 3 doesn't divide 2, but it, so it has to divide 12. Or if we expressed it as 4 times 6, 3 does not divide 4, so it has to divide 6. Otherwise, how could it possibly divide 24? And another, another one, 3 divides... 30, which is, well, 3 times 10 is kind of obvious. It divides 3. It doesn't divide 10, so it has to divide 3. Or we could say it's 5 times 6. Well, it doesn't divide 5. 3 doesn't divide 5, so 3 has to divide 6. Or we could say it's 2 times 15. 3 doesn't divide 2, so it has to divide 15 in order to divide 30. So that's the general principle. Sort of, we can't we can't break P apart, so we have to shove it all into one side or the other. But how would we prove that? Let me take these examples off now. I probably haven't got enough space. To prove it, we're going to have to use a rather sneaky result. So the proof uses the following fact. It's about when, what happens if you have um, two numbers whose highest common factor is 1. So suppose, suppose that the highest common factor of x and y is 1. Then we can do this clever thing where we can, we can express 1 as some combination of x's and y's like this then there exist r and s integers with r times x plus s times y equals 1. So let's think about this for a second. For example, if we had uh, if we had 3 and 5, the highest common factor of 3 and 5 is 1. So how can we get some number of 3s to 
together with some number of fives. This can be minus, right, because s is an integer. It doesn't have to be a natural number. So this can be a minus, really, in there. So can we get some number of threes plus some number of fives to get, to get one? Well, we can because we could say, uh, we could say, we could do nine and ten, right? They're one apart. Or we could do six and five. They're one apart as well. So we could go two times six minus one times five equals one. So these, these, this is the, this is the R, and this is the S. And these two things are not unique, right? Because we could also have had. We could, oh wait, that's supposed to be a 3. 2 times 3 is 6, right? 6 minus 5 is 1. So we could also have had minus 3 times 3 plus 2 times 5 equals 1. Because this is minus 9, and that's 10, and we get 1. So this here is now the R, and this here is the S. And... What else could we have had? Well, we could also have used 21 minus 20, right? We could have had 7 times 3 minus 4 times 5 equals 1. So there are lots of possible different ways of taking some number of 3s together with some number of 5s and making 1. And it doesn't matter, there are loads and loads and loads of ways, but the point is there is at least one way. And we could try this again, we could try this also with, let's do another example, we could try this with, um, well, you can pick an example of two numbers whose highest common factor is one, and you can try it yourself. Let's try it with seven and four. Four and seven. So these numbers don't have to be prime, it's just that their highest common factor has to be one. Well, that was kind of easy. We could do 2 times 4 minus 1 times 7 is 1. Let's do another one. Let's do 6 and uh, 6 and 11. Well, let's do two, two numbers that, are, that, that don't have any common factors at all. Let's do 6 and... Oh, my mind's gone completely blank. Let's do 6 and... I keep thinking of really easy examples. Okay, let's do six. Let's do six and eleven. Well, that was too easy as well because we can do two times six minus one times eleven equals one. So how is this how is this fact going to help us? Well, it's going to help us extraordinarily easily because given that there exist such numbers. We've got Rx plus Sy equals 1, whenever the highest common factor of x and y is 1. So let's suppose that P does not divide A. P does not divide A, but P is prime. So the highest common factor of P and A has to be 1. So we have some R and S with R P plus S A equals 1. Now, I haven't got very much time left, but let's multiply the entire thing through by B. R P B plus S A B equals B. Now look, P definitely divides R P B, right? And P definitely divides S A B because we know that P divides A B. But that means that P divides the entire left-hand side, which means that P has to divide B. P divides RPB, and P divides AB, so that means that P divides B. So let's just go through what we did again. We said, suppose that P divides AB. Ah, suppose P divides AB. But suppose it doesn't divide A. So what we have to conclude is that P does divide B. So what we say is that, well, if it doesn't divide A, the highest common factor of P and A has to be 1. So we go through this trick, and we conclude that P does divide B.